Welcome back to another episode of the Pursuit of Progress podcast. As always, my name is Adam, and I'm really excited. We have a, a special episode today. My co-host, Ben, is off living the good life over in Europe with his family for a couple weeks. And while he's overseas, I'm manning the ship back here in the States and um, taking the opportunity to interview a few people that I've had on my radar for a while and have just had a lot of respect and admiration for different things that they have going on in their life. And with our guest today, Eli, I've just really respected his ability to juggle a lot of stuff between his family, his two different full-time careers, just a lot on his plates. Excited to you know dive deeper into all of that today. Uh, but before we get into that, Eli, welcome to the show. Hope you're having a good one. How are you doing, bud? Adam, I'm doing good. And it's such a blessing to be on your podcast. I know that we're in two totally different markets, but it's a pleasure to be able to connect with you and your audience. And I think we're going to have a really good talk today on your podcast. So I'm super excited. Thanks, man. Yeah, I am too. I know we've um, got a lot in common, just haven't had a chance really to connect one-on-one -on -one too much yet. So hopefully this will be the, the first of, of many conversations we have together. Um, before we you know, go a little bit more deeper yep. into some of the stuff that I'm really interested to learn more about with you, give the audience just a little bit of a background on you know, who you are, you know, what kind of stuff is going on in, in your world at the moment, and just a little bit of uh, info so they can learn more about you. Man, Adam, what is not going on in my world? Like, <laughs> it's so crazy right now. And it's really a blessing, right? Because we pray for these moments. And really, I'm just a simple dude from Albuquerque, New Mexico, you know, down southwest. You know, the only time people hear about us is from the whole Bugs Bunny thing, Breaking Bad, and then now Oppenheimer putting us on the map a little bit there. But really, like, I'm just, like I tell my wife, I'm not that much of an interesting guy. But I do so much, like you said, I have on my plate that sometimes people find that interesting that when I talk about these kinds of things, me being as humble as I am, I'm just like, man, this is just me going through my daily life, like pretty much just checking the boxes and make sure that we're doing the things that is necessary in order to progress forward. Right. So being born and raised here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, you know, I'm a first generation uh, Mex Mexican American. Awesome. So for me to just kind of be on these things, doing these podcasts, you know, being in the game of real estate, juggling two different jobs, it's a lot of work, but at the same time, I feel very blessed, right? Because I get the opportunity that most people don't get, you know, from the stories and from the places that I come from to be able to do this kind of stuff. It's like, man, I'm living the life. And especially being from Albuquerque, because not a whole lot of amazing things come from here. And it's unfortunate that we get a lot of negative backlash um, from the news and all those kinds of outlets that when we do these kinds of things, even with our YouTube channel, when we put our city in a positive light, people just kind of flip the switch and are like, huh, that makes sense, right? It, everybody has their problems, but it seems like you guys are just kind of simple living. You're not too crazy. You know, that kind of is my vibe. So I dig it. So a lot of people moving down here for that, you know, being a family man, I'm very young. I'm 30 years old, even though I feel like I'm 50, right? I feel like I've been put through the ringer, you know, the past 20 some years of my life, you know, growing up in, in kind of like a middle class area, you know, family, but also being involved in a lot of negative things, right? I, I feel like I've climbed out of that and I can speak to those kinds of things and give, a, you know, the kids that are like me that were told that number one, you're not going to be able to go to uh, school, college, do all these great and amazing things. I kind of feel like I'm, I'm a voice to those little people um, as far as like, man, you can, like as far as like putting your mind down and writing a plan and achieving those kinds of things, it's possible you can do it. English is my second language. I didn't learn how to speak English until I was in grade school. So for me to be, you know, chatting with these higher level people and just having these great conversations, they don't, they can't even tell. And for me, it's just like, man, we're making it, we're doing it. We're setting the standard for the next generation. What an example, right? I know I kind of went off on a bit of a tangent there, but I get super passionate about, you know, these kinds of things. And for me, that's the whole reason why I'm doing this whole real estate game is because nobody ever showed me anything about real estate. I just kind of dove in head first. Like there's, there's no like real entrepreneurship within my family, um, except for like some people back in Mexico, but I don't really talk to them. Um, so to be able to be here doing this thing is like, man, yeah, it's freaking cool. So you're, you're a family man, you've got a wife and you said two kids. What are the ages of your two kiddos? What are the ages of your two kiddos? 
Uh, my kiddos, my son is six, going to be seven here in August, and my daughter is 12, going on 15. Woo! <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got some serious dynamics going on in your household. Yeah. Oh, gosh. And it's it's crazy because it's like a blink of an eye, right? They always tell me like the blink syndrome thing, and it's true, right? One minute, my daughter is like running around acting like she wants to be a superhero, Captain America, playing in mud, and now she's like wanting the most expensive makeup and talking about boys and all this stuff. And I'm just like, I'm not ready for any of this. <laughs> You're a better man than me. That sounds overwhelming <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> so I love to just before we dive in more into real estate and mindset and some of these other things that I want to ask you about, give the audience just a little bit more background on, you know, your current situation. So you have another full-time job outside of real estate. What, uh, what is that? I don't even know what else you do. So my other full-time gig is I'm the warehouse supervisor for the police department here in Albuquerque. And I handle everything that comes through here as far as like products, guns, paper, gloves, I mean, tourniquets, handcuffs, all that stuff. I'm the one that supplies them with that kind of deal. And we have a pretty, you know, large team here that we run. Even managing that, right, has taught me so much to be able to manage people through my real estate business. But I mean... I, I've been, I started here when I started my real estate career and it's really just grown with me throughout real estate that it, I've learned to work hand in hand with both of them. So it's such a blessing to be able to be in this position. I know that we sit here and it's like, man, Eli, you must be doing good. You probably don't need that job. And I don't, but to be honest with you, the people that I get to connect with here and, you know, the officers that I get to help, it's just so freaking amazing to be able to get that right. Because I feel like I'm giving back a little bit um, as far as like making sure that they have what they need to be able to, you know, serve and protect the community. Right. Because as real estate agents through our licensing, that's kind of one of our ethical things, I believe. It's like you're supposed to serve and protect the, the community. But this is just kind of like me just giving back to the ones that are truly out there putting themselves in the, the line of fire and. It's super cool. I don't know. Um, I know stacking boxes and ordering all this stuff isn't glamorous, but it works out for me to be able to allow me to do real estate a lot easier, right? And my biggest thing with this whole thing, bringing this conversation up is that when you're diving into real estate, they tell you like, man, if you aren't fully in, you probably won't succeed. And I'm kind of living proof that you can right? You can succeed in doing both because you just got to create that structure and that consistency to where you're not doing all kinds of crazy things and you just create systems and processes behind it. And it just kind of all works on its own. So yeah, pretty cool. I would though say it from an outsider's perspective, witnessing you being able to, you know, successfully do that. Like you just said, it's all about the systems and processes. You know, we have these you know, weekly Zoom calls on our CRM system. So how we manage all of our leads and our contacts and these just different meetings on a weekly basis for kind of educating ourselves and you know, becoming more of a, a higher level, um, being able to implement the stuff at a higher level. And you're one of the few people that I see on a lot of those meetings. So despite having a full-time second, you know, job, you're still making the time and intentionally going on and being in these meetings where you're, you're actually walking the walk and you're building out those systems. And I totally agree with that, man. That is a key to success if you got a lot going on in your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, to add to that, it, I'm very fortunate that being in the position that I'm in, I have my own office. I pretty much just kind of do my own thing and nobody really bothers me, especially being here throughout a lot of changes, right? 2018. The department was going through a lot of changes, you know, and then the whole thing came through and the department was going through a bunch of stuff. So I've kind of earned my little place here. And a lot of people just kind of leave me alone for now. And I say for now because they always want something from me. But that has allowed so much freedom for me, for me to be able to do these kinds of things, right? To be able to take meetings in the middle of the day, to be able to go show a house and do that kind of stuff. And I know some jobs aren't as easy and flexible as that. So when I do have this conversation with people, I just tell them like, let's figure out what you can do, right? Right now I have an agent that works under me. I'm very fortunate that it's actually my father-in-law. <laughs> so when I do have this conversation with him because he also has a job, I let him know like, hey, let's figure out what you can do, right? When is that time that you can dedicate an hour to your business, right? And we had this recently and it's funny that it just happened that this conversation of if you only had an hour in a day to do your business, what would you do? 
And that's, that's the conversation that I have with a ton of people and I've been having with people because for me, that's how I was able to digest it. When I first started this, I was like, I only got a lunch to, to do my real estate business. What can I do within that hour to help me progress this? And then after five o'clock, when we get out, that's when I can go show houses. That's when I can do this, that, and the third. And that also taught me how to create a schedule, right? And sticking to it because that's where a lot of people get it confused is that with the freedom of real estate, you feel like, man, I, I have all this freedom. I'm going to go show this house. I'm going to go show this house nine, three, one, and your schedule is all sporadic. For me, I really tried not to show any houses until after five o'clock. And, and I tell people that I'm like, Hey, I got meetings all day, whether I do or don't, it's like, Hey, I'm going to respect your time and I'm going to give it to you, but you also got to respect mine. And I can show you houses after five o'clock. And if that works for you, great. If it doesn't and you want to see him sooner, that's just a filter for me now to know that, hey, I'm probably not the guy for you. And I, I can't jump at every beck and call. So really understand that. So yeah, maybe this the second job that you do have in a way, maybe that's kind of forcing you to be super focused and intentional with that limited time you have, like you're saying, your hour lunch break or after 5 p.m. in the evenings, being able to you know, be, have your back up against a wall where like you need to get your stuff done because you have mm -hmm. a very limited, as opposed to a typical realtor that wakes up, gets their cup of coffee, sits down, I don't, you know, not really sure what I should work on. And then all of a sudden after two hours on social media, it's time for lunch and how much do they even really get done in a day as opposed to maybe somebody like you that's gotten more done in just 60 minutes than they did all day long. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest with you, that came about even before I started this real estate thing. Um, when I was younger, I used to work, well, I worked, used to work in the automotive industry and that's maybe as, I should have added that into the whole background thing, but I worked in the automotive industry for over 10 years since I was 17. And at 17 years old, transitioning to 18, I was already managing like three or four mechanics on their time. Right. And, and being that filter for them, what they can and can't do and letting conversating with customers and laying that out. So for me, it was just like, what can I take out of this whole busy work thing to make this a lot more effective? Because I certainly don't want to be here doing this all day. And I don't want to sit here just, you know, wasting my time. I want to make sure that number one, these people are in and out of here because they got stuff to do as well. And number two, I certainly don't want to be stuck with these people all day. So is it a little bit of a negative thing? Is it kind of me being lazy? Don't want to deal with that whole stuff? Maybe, I don't know, but it acted as a way for me to figure out how can I really be effective with my time? Not so much efficient, right? Because I can't control if, you know, that mechanic decides to drain the wrong drain pan and their transmission oil has been drained out and they were there for an oil change. You know, it's those kinds of things I can't control, but what can I control? And that's like, hey, effective time management. Hey, customer, like, hey, it's going to take me hour and 30 minutes to do your old change when it's really going to take 45, right? So that whole under promise over deliver kind of thing. And, you know, just figuring out those little nuances of like, man, what don't I want to do? And I didn't realize that until, you know, almost 10 years later that that's what I was actually doing, you know, figuring out the things that I did not want to do and replacing them with things that could move things forward. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been crazy. This whole ride of just managing, you know, one job to another, to a family, it's a lot. Right. And I told, I tell people like, don't get sexy and don't get glamorous. Don't try to say that you're going to do all these crazy things because you're not mm -hmm. just really focus on one thing that you can do today in order to change your business. If you got time for other stuff, great. Once you start to figure out your schedule, what a week looks like, and you create some consistency, um, and you start to take things out of your life that don't make any sense. So I know one of the biggest questions that I get asked is how do you do all this? Like, how do you have the energy to number one, wake up at, you know, four 30 in the morning to work out, go to a job from six to four 30, um, and then still come home and do real estate, do all this stuff, manage kids, manage your wife. And it's the matter of fact that I took a lot of things out of my life. Like I don't hang out with a whole bunch of people. I'm home a majority of the time. I, I don't drink alcohol anymore and I haven't had a sip of alcohol since uh, last November. I used to smoke a ton of cigars and that just showed me that I was just taking time away from things that I can actually do. And that actually, in, in that sense of trying to figure out where I can get more time, 
I discovered that I can actually get more energy by taking those things out. And man, it's, it's been such a, a life changing experience the past couple of months that, um, I even had a conversation with one of my pastors. Um, it's funny because he also owns a cigar shop down here. So he's a bit of this, this like dichotomy of what a pastor should be. Mm-hmm. And I told him, dude, I'm sitting in this position where it's like, I'm, I'm fighting of this, this position of letting go of who I thought I was supposed to be, what I was supposed to be doing and all this stuff. And really looking forward to this position of what God wants me to be. And it's like, it all started, you know, six, eight months ago when I let go of things that no longer served me and allowed me to add more energy and time into the things that actually push the needle forward, actually make me feel good and actually are important to me. So, well, the fact that you've been able to identify a lot of that at 30, kudos to you, buddy, because I'm 41 and I feel like I'm just now understanding some of that. Like, it's okay to not have to feel like you need to go out every Friday and Saturday night and drink with your other friends that are still doing that routine. You know, I mean, just being able to have that self awareness and just realize that there's more to it than just, you know, drinking on the weekends. And, and I imagine, so like with your wife, you know, let's take the kids out of the picture for a minute with such a full schedule, does she also work or is she a stay at home mom and helping kind of handle all of these other things that need to get done at home that you have very limited time to, to get done? And really good question. So she's like the rock in Mm -hmm. all of this, right? She's the glue that takes care of everything here. And lucky enough that she actually has a full-time job, but she works from home and our kids are homeschooled. Although that can be a recipe for disaster, right? Because the kids are in her hair all day. And that's why when I get home, I'm pretty much like the default parent to play Mm -hmm. around, take their energy and all this stuff uh, while she takes care of some other things. But she really holds it down. She makes sure that number one, I have everything that I need to make sure that I can do what I'm doing. She handles all the finances. And it's funny because the running joke within our circle, I tell people, I don't even know if I have any money. Like, to be honest with you guys, if I take you out to dinner or out to lunch or whatever the case is, I'm afraid that my card is going to get declined. (laughs) And it's because I've given her so much and maybe that's a negative thing. But at the same time, we've understood those roles, right? She understands that, hey, you're going to be out, you know, sometimes till eight o'clock at night, you're probably not going to be home for dinner. But so long as I communicate with with her on that, and we have the same um, calendars that we share, and she knows what's going on in my life, she's okay. But for the majority of the time, it's just her holding it down, making sure that the kids are going doing their schooling, she's making lunches, she's making dinners, she's doing all this stuff for us, especially me to keep on continuing to move forward. Uh, not only that, those those small nuances, she also makes sure that our health is on point. She's worked in the medical field for so long that she's just all about health and not, she's all about health and fitness. She's not as crazy as I am about the fitness thing, but she definitely recognizes that it is important she more so less takes care of us on like make sure that we eat clean eat healthy uh i take all these you know vitamins and minerals and things throughout the day and it works and for us it's like hey thanks for taking on that responsibility you are pretty much the boss at home is what i tell her like this is your domain i just get an opportunity to kind of live here anything that needs to get done based off of what you need i'm there just understand that outside of that domain is kind of my world with business and all this stuff. And I, you know, we've had this conversation recently. I told her, look, you may not necessarily understand all the decisions that I'm making. And sometimes I don't have all the time to explain them to you. The only thing you got to do is trust me. And that that's the big thing, right? When you have a relationship in business, because business can get in the way of all of this. Absolutely. If you let it, and it can really destroy you. And what I tell people is like, clear communication and just, you know, understanding where they're at and having that trust of one another to understand that, Hey, I don't have to worry about anything at home because I I know she's going to take care of it. And on the reverse, she doesn't have to worry about anything like financial or any, or anything business wise, because she knows that I'm going to handle it all within the right intention of making sure that it's for our family to progress forward. We're fine. 
right? Because there has been moments where it, I've not done that, right? And I've had to learn by trial by fire. I got married very early. I was 23. I had my daughter at 18. So I had to grow up really fast in this world of trying to figure out what to do, what I want to be. And it wasn't until I turned 25 that I got into the real estate game that I was like, yeah, like this is real. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know if we can cuss on your podcast, but yeah, um, that's fine. It at that point, that's how I felt. Like I, I felt so new to this new world or so lost to this new world that it's really taken me this past five years to figure all this out. And, you know, I, I appreciate you telling me to, that at 30, you know, it's a good thing to figure all this stuff out because I don't feel like I got to figure it out. I'm just like going day by day, just sitting here like, man, like, what did I do wrong yesterday that I can make better today? Or like, oh, that's interesting that, you know, I act that way. Why do I act that way? Or it's like, mm -hmm. huh, do I really want to do those things? Like, why is that important to me? Right. And it's those kinds of conversations that I'm having now. And maybe it's part of the growing up process. I don't know. Nobody's like giving you a play by play on this. You're just kind of figuring it out on your own. You would know better than I would. Right. Um, you got a lot more life experience than I do. So. Yeah, that's a big part of our just our title of our podcast, the pursuit of progress, you know, just identifying like what those 1%, you know, tasks or action items are in your life at that moment. And what can you do just to make yourself 1% better every day? And it's such a buzzword, not even a buzzword, I don't think yet, but just the, the word consistency, I think more than any other word in the dictionary is what becomes more and more just kind of apparent in my daily life just mindset as far as if I can just be consistent with whatever it is that I'm focusing on, everything else is going to work out. And I think that through consistency, no matter what it is, you know, as long as you're somewhat steering your boat in the right direction, you know, you're going to see success. You know, so consistency just seems to be the underlying thing with all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my biggest thing. And, um, I really learned that through skateboarding. So another background is that I, I, I've been skateboarding since I was 11 years old and I even managed a skateboarding team at like 15. So oh. to see the, the way consistency and progress works through trying a trick after trick after trick. I mean, sometimes you would spend a whole night trying one trick to land it once and you're like, God, like all that trial and error just to land at once means everything. And it was just because you were consistent and persistent at doing this one thing. Right. And that was for me, a pinnacle. We used to have this phrase, you know, around the skate parks, it was like consistency is king. Like just, just show up. Like every Saturday we would meet at the, at the skate park seven o'clock in the morning and we would just skate all morning. And it was like, man, what, what are you trying to accomplish today? What's the skill that you want to do or, what trick do you want to land today? And it's like, let's work on that. What do you, what, what do you lag on that you want to be better? So I've been lucky enough to be in this kind of world of like personal development for a long time. And I didn't even realize it. So consistency, I'm with you, Adam. Like if more people can figure out how they can be consistent throughout their days, life would be just way easier. And of course, curveballs are going to get thrown at you. That's life. But so long as you have a consistency, it's like a script, right? You have this script and you get thrown off of the script. If you have it, you know, figured out and you've practiced it enough times, you know how to get back on script once you get derailed, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's that consistency and just getting after it. I couldn't agree with you more. I love that. So let's uh, dive a little bit more specifically into real estate and that, that career, career number. I don't want to say career number two, because I think that I'm sure ideally would be moving forward career number one and scaling that up to the point where at some point, maybe you don't, you know, continue to work at the, the second job. Maybe who knows? I'm speaking, maybe just out of turn. I'm not sure if that's the case, but um, <laughs> what would you say like is your, like your unique value proposition? Like what is it about how you run your business that sets you apart from other real estate agents in Albuquerque? Because I, from an outsider, just, you know, looking at your social and just your branding um, from your personal branding, you do a great job with video. Again, going back to that word consistency, you're always posting um, not just content to post content, but I feel like your content is very intentional and adding a lot of value to whoever's watching it. 
Yeah. Um, is that all stuff that you've learned just through being part of our legit, legit agents crew? Or like, what is it that you really see, you know, looking in the mirror, like, what is it that sets you apart from other agents in your, in your area? That, to be honest with you, it's everything that we just talked about. It's the growth. Personally, I've been on Instagrams for years now, right? I've been on social media doing YouTube and all this stuff. I just never figured out how to do it. And once I joined the group, it allowed me to have the recipe to put all these different skill sets that I've been working on as far as video goes, as far as being myself on camera and all that stuff, just, and then really marrying it so it makes sense and through a process that actually works. After I figured that out, it was like, huh, that's interesting. People are wanting to do business with me because I had formulated my own opinions about some city that nobody even really wants to move to. That's freaking crazy. So mm -hmm. after that, I kind of just gave myself the permission to move forward with everything else. And it was just like, hey, the unique value that I have for other people is myself. Why don't I show up on videos dressed up and have like suits and all this stuff and nothing against that. But my whole MO going, going into this was like, I don't want to own any suits. I wore ties for the past, you know, seven years. I don't feel like that's me. So I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to show everybody that it's possible. I'm going to show everybody that I can sell houses with a t-shirt on and a ball cap and, and gauges and tattoos, right? I'm going to show everybody that it's possible because I'm the only voice out here doing it, so I might as well, right? Because it looks cool to do real estate. It really does, right? You see it all the time, this Instagram flex and all that stuff. And I'm out here fucking shooting videos of me running with my dog and telling people why they should move to Albuquerque or top seven reasons, right? And that's that all came through YouTube, right? Figuring out like, hey, YouTube is is not a thing of leisure. It's really a search engine that people are looking uh, for information for to make big life decisions, right? You go and buy a car. What's the first thing you're going to look for information on? YouTube. You're going to buy an expensive, you know, $300 tool set and you want to see how good it is. You're going to YouTube, right? So once I figured that out and the guys taught me how to put it all together and the only thing I had to interject was myself, it was like, all right, cool. This is, this is my domain. This is my lane. And you're, to answer your question, transition, it's going to happen. I know that it is. I already see it happening because um, more people are calling. And I'm fortunate enough that I'm one of the, I'm the only fastest growing YouTube channel for relocation in New Mexico. So there's one other guy that's doing it. He only posts one video a month. I do two videos a week right now. So I definitely outpaced him within a year. We're four subscribers away from a thousand subscribers. And we're well past 80,000 views. So it's like, I've, I've made myself the authority. I see that. How can I scale this much more? So YouTube's taking the forefront of everything that I do, right? It's now more or less like my brand. Cultura Real Estate is what we call our brand here locally. But overall, the main one is going to be living in Albuquerque. And I've even switched like some of the things that I do on Instagram to be that more of that YouTube style, like top seven reasons of why you should move here, you know, what the biggest thing that I learned here over 30 years of living in Albuquerque, stuff like that, right? And two of the pieces that I learned that are the value of it is my opinion and my unique view of whatever I'm posting on there, right? My The video that I'm shooting, what I'm showing the people as far as like an, a drone shot, all that stuff, right? It's all It's all interesting to see how being yourself through video People are actually thirsting for that connection for like, and you feel like a real person. And it's like, well, I am like, what you're going to see in this video is exactly what you're going to get, what you get on a zoom call and people get thrown back. And I had those conversations on zoom where it's like, man, you really are like on your videos. It's pretty crazy. And I'm like, well, why, why should I portray anything different? <laughs> Authenticity is huge, man. So are you also, obviously you said English is your second language. Is your target audience still, because it seems at least I've always witnessed your content being in English. Have you also, you know, tested the waters with, you know, doing advertising and pushing, putting your messaging out there in Spanish? I haven't. I haven't. And I know that I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot with that one there. It is on my plan of things to do for sure. And it always has been. 
It's just that figuring that out, that extra layer of how to do that. I'm going to be taken away from other things yep. to, to, to do that. So finding the time to do it, what's really been killing me right now, but I, I definitely would like to do it because a lot of people who are within that community, Spanish speaking community are underserved, right? And if you look at statistics about more than 70% of homeowners are Hispanic and, yeah. and, and it's a big community that, man, I could really help out and touch. I think here locally where I'm at, it'd be more so or less like getting involved in like in community engagement kind of things. Maybe some Facebook stuff. Mexicans love Facebook for whatever reason, right? I think it's easy for us to communicate with our loved ones, you know, in Mexico and stuff like that. So it's a super easy platform to get on there. So maybe I'll start doing some stuff on there. Um, I don't know. I haven't really figured out what the next step would be or how that looks uh, in terms of even doing YouTube, because it's crazy that I get calls from people that who live in Mexico and they, they are looking to move here. And it's like, I didn't even know you spoke Spanish and it's like, yeah. And I'm, and they get thrown back that I'm fluid in Spanish. So it, it's pretty awesome to see how powerful this thing is. Right. Well, yeah. In Denver, I saw a stat recently that like 25% of Denver residents right now speak a, their native language is something other than English. So I can imagine Albuquerque is probably higher than that. I would think. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's more than that here, to be honest with you. Um, and, and it's like, I don't know when I looked it up, it, the stats were like astronomically crazy and I couldn't, I couldn't fathom it because I just thought it was just in one part of our town that it was really just kind of that dynamic, but no, like almost like 80% of people here speak Spanish and it's crazy. And there's two different kinds of Spanish dialect here, right? You have like the New Mexican and then you have like the, the super south, south of the border Mexican, like I speak. So sometimes like when I'm talking to like, for instance, like my wife's family, they speak, they speak um, New Mexican Spanish and um, it's totally different. I'll say something and they'll, they'll just look at me with a blank face. Like, what did you just say? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I think you're, uh, you're talking about the. The reasons people know Albuquerque, the one you did not say that's probably my number one reason why I want I want to go back there is for the uh, hot air balloon. Festival. Oh yeah, so maybe you need to get a uh, you know your your branded hot air balloon. Maybe that could be like a five year goal. That'd be cool. That'd be super cool. There's I think one agent that has a hot air balloon, and um, he's like the top agent. He's been the top agent for the longest time. Um, and, um, they're actually not that expensive. I mean, obviously they are pretty expensive, but in hindsight, I thought they were going to be like, you know, a quarter of a million of a dollars and all that stuff, but you can buy a hot air balloon for like 80 grand. <laughs> I'm a aspiring pilot. And one thing that always blew me away is to get your hot air balloon license. You only, re it only requires you to have 10 logged hours of flight time, which for an, of a pilot, it's usually between 45 and 60. But I was just thinking, you know, 10 hours, like that seems intense. Like I That's cannot nothing. imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary though. Those things are scary. I do not dare to get in one. I do not. Well, if you sponsor one, that might be uh, something you need to, you know. I'd love to. I'd love to. Right now, like, uh, you know, because you brought it up, one of our biggest uh, communities here in Albuquerque is like the fight communities, like boxing, MMA, and a bare knuckle. Like bare knuckle we're the home to bare knuckle. Um, I am very fortunate that one of my like mentors growing up, he's like my best friend, really, or I would say like an older brother at this point, um, is one of the uh, state champs. For boxing so he's actually boxing this weekend and we're lucky enough to be able to sponsor him we're on his oh, shorts cool. and all that kind of deal yeah so i i try not to do those sponsorship things a whole lot because i don't want to be portrayed as this guy is like throwing money just to have our name everywhere one thing that i do really like to give back to like communities obviously i have a soft spot for kiddos so like a couple of years ago we sponsored like a girl softball team a, a dance you know studio Stuff like that. And for me, it's just like to see the kiddos get the opportunity to do cool stuff and turn the negative outlook of what we have around here to something positive is pretty freaking cool to me. So and one last thing before we move on, just a plug for how valuable and powerful YouTube is, is somebody like you that has such a limited amount of time that you can spend on your real estate, not in your real estate business, but just on your real estate business. 
with YouTube, you know, you spend that couple hours filming videos. Hopefully I'm guessing you're outsourcing your editing. I'm guessing one video a week. I still edit one of them. Okay. But just the, the value of with YouTube, it's working for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So somebody like you that has a very packed full schedule outside of real estate, you know, it's a great lead gen avenue to pursue because you're still getting those leads coming in and you're not necessarily at your desk cold calling and door knocking and doing all these other you know traditional lead gen type activities yep yep the hell with door knocking and all that stuff i'm i'm good at it just because i was put through the ring of fire door knocking in new york when i lived out there for sort of door sales for uh, a solar panel company that was atrocious. Have Dude, I you, have uh, PTSD? Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> me too. So, um, yeah, we won't talk about door knocking because then I'll start having flashbacks of all these crazy New Yorkers. When I uh, graduated <laughs> college in marketing, I got bamboozled into this sports marketing job, which oh. you know, they did a great job making me think I, you know, had to fight for the job, and I got the job, and then it was going door to door in businesses, basically selling these golf coupon cards. And my God, man, I, I still, this is 20 plus years later and I still have PTSD and it still affects my ability to pick up the phone and, and call people. I mean, it, yeah, there's yeah. something to be said about that. Yeah. Yeah. For me, the phone calling is okay. I can, I can do that all day because I have a different approach about it, but door knocking, I'm just like, I want to knock on your door and run. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, just I, I look at you as again somebody that is uh, you're very you value you know just uh, health, fitness. You really value you know that side of of your your lifestyle. Walk me through a little bit of that. So you said you know you're an early riser, and I'm guessing that's because from four thirty to six, that's the only time of the day where you don't have distractions and there's no copping out because you don't have something else that's pulling you in a different direction at that time in the morning. I'm a huge advocate also for the early morning workouts for anybody that's a professional that has a lot of other stuff going on in their life. Yeah. Walk me through yours. Do you have, are you a big like morning routine guy or is that just more of a buzzword to you? I mean, do you have certain things that you do consistently in the morning or just on a daily basis to really you help know you perform at a high level? Good question. Uh, for me, I know right now it's that whole like, oh, teens are stupid. Don't do routines and that kind of deal. Personally, when you look at it, it's like you got a routine as a human being, whatever you're doing, right? Whether it's like you wake up and you get straight to work and you drink your coffee. It's like, that's still a routine. Call it whatever you want to call it. Like, like in a green and call it a pickle at this point. It's still a routine. For me, my routine is I like to wake up. I like to drink my, my water hydrate and I put it on my Instagram all the time, right? I hydrate, I do the MLS, I do my pre-workout and then I do my workout. So that's basically like the, the boxes that I tick to make sure that I can go on with my day to have at least somewhat of a good day because those things got taken care of. So yeah, waking up super early is not a sense of me being like this hurrah early riser dude. It's just really, like you said, the only time that I have, that's not going to be all these different distractions pulling me in several different directions, phone going off and all that stuff. It's really just kind of me just digesting everything that I'm going to do for the day, planning it out, reading, you know, the book right now I'm, I'm reading the Bible and, you know, reading meditations by Marcus Aurelius. So um, just picking out different things where I can get a nugget from and just kind of be like, huh, that's interesting. Let me write about that. See if I can apply it to my day. Oddly enough, things that I've been reading recently just have been applying to different conversations that I have throughout the day. So it helps me out to be able to repeat that and it helps me to understand it myself a little bit more. But back to the whole routine thing, working out and all that stuff, it really stemmed like years ago from waking up early to go to the skate park to, you know, having to go to school and doing this and that in the third, you know, you had to be really rigid with your time as far as like, Hey, we got to get up early to get you to school. Then after school, you got to get home to do your homework. And then after you do your homework, you can go to the skate park, right? That was my end goal. I was like, how can I take care of everything that I have to get done in order to go to the skate park to do more work, obviously. But that was it for me is like, what things can I take care of to help me get to my goal at the end of the day? Aside from skateboarding, at 15 years old, my dad started bodybuilding. Well, 
his kind of discipline and his rigidness with the schedules and stuff like that kind of bled into me. And I started figuring out like what time blocking was, what we can and can't do in these times. Like when are we going to go to the gym, eating, all that stuff. And I really started around like the age of 20, really kind of taking it serious. And that's when like everything kind of like flipped the switch for me that like, oh, discipline and doing these different routines throughout your days and having that consistency allows you to, like I said, get back on script when you get knocked off. So for the people that are sitting here wondering like, and all these people are telling me not to have a routine just to get straight to it. Yeah. You know, could that work? Yeah. If, if you're that type of person, but some of us need an hour to kind of get, you know, going just because, Hey man, like yesterday was a day. Like I just need maybe an extra 30 minutes of sleep, an extra hour of sleep, because I know that if I don't get those extra 30, 45 minutes uh, of sleep, my day is going to be shit and I'm going to be running like shit. So I got to figure out how I can best perform and that comes with this whole self-awareness thing that that is a kind of a buzzword nowadays, but nobody really knows how to practice it. And it's really sitting down and and looking at yourself and saying like, okay, what works for me? What am I good at? What don't I want to do? And if I don't want to do them, how can I delegate them to somebody else? And that really just allowed me the freedom to be able to sit here and say like, okay, 4.30 to like 6 o'clock is really like the only time that I have for myself. And what am I going to sacrifice at that point? Maybe an hour or two of sleep. Can I stomach that? Sure. Maybe can I squeeze in an, a nap during the day? And you don't hear that a lot, right? Not a lot of people are going to tell you like, hey, during the day, take a nap. I'm here to tell you 15 minutes of, of sleep is going to change your day astronomically to perform for the rest of the day. So it's just those kinds of things, right? Figuring out patterns, figuring out where I can be consistent at figuring out myself and how I perform based off of certain things, taking out things that don't work and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, I know I went, you know, all over the place. I hope that no, I answers like that. the question. It's really one of those things that it, it's really person by person basis, right? We can kind of give this generality to people like, Hey, you got to be disciplined and you got to do this when you wake up and all that stuff. Truth of the matter is, is not everybody's Jocko Willink waking up every day at four o'clock, like some of us are just going to be tired. And that's just what it is. Can we still perform to the top of our level and get things done? Yeah, but that comes with consistency and focus on what you're going to work on, right? Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, for myself, you know, I deal with, you know, self confidence at times and just feeling kind of overwhelmed. And those days, like you mentioned, where you had a doozy of a day yesterday, and you know, Burn the midnight oil on those days when you still wake up the next morning early, you still go to the gym, you still hold yourself accountable and, and, and go to the gym on those days, especially, but every day that you do these things on those days is when, when you're leaving the gym, just this, it's not really talked about much, but just this endorphin, whatever you want to call it, endorphin rush, but just this extra level of confidence that sets the tone for the rest of the day. And I don't care how tired you are you always feel better after leaving the gym. And even if it is at four 30 in the morning, you're waking up, like there is so much value in just putting yourself out there and making it happen. And then being, you know, how much better of a day you end up having and being able to then realize on the days yeah. that you don't do that, how you feel off and you're not at a hundred percent. And, and, you know, to add to that for me, what recently helped out a ton was, figuring out what I can and can't do again, but I've created this, this lifestyle to where there's really no like friction for me to do these things. Right. So I, I got lucky enough that before everything got super expensive, I purchased all this gym equipment and put it inside of my garage. So there's really no excuse for me to wake up and just go straight to the gym. Right. It's just a matter of fact of getting in there. And, and, I don't ever try to be that person that blames other people for me not being able to do these things. So I've always learned to involve my family, right? And there's that word of balance. Like, how do you figure out the balance in all this stuff? And I tell people there is none, right? As, as cute as it sounds and as weird as it sounds, the more you can involve your family in these things that you're doing with your life, the easier things get. So for me, my kiddos come in and out of the gym. They're working out with me. They're on the treadmill doing these, these, these different things, hang, hanging out in the gym. And now it's like become a common place for us to just kind of get together, right? So 
I, I took away the friction altogether. Now it's a thing that we do, right? It's not a matter of fact of, oh, we got to go do this. No, it's like, yeah, we're going to go do this because this is what we do, right? It's not a matter of fact that. question or we're going to do it or not. It's There's what we do. Like definitely, we up, um, dad goes up, something to be said up, there too does about his thing, just... works out and then comes back in to hang out with us. Like it's, it's just my life. Like I really don't try to create any separation, you know, through all these different things. I really just try to involve my family in everything that I do. And for me, it works out simple, the better, right? I try not to add more stuff that, you know, seems like it'd be cool, right? Because I really would love to pick up like more fishing. Fishing is my thing. But the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, being away all morning on a Saturday is nothing productive to my business or my family right now. So it kind of has to take the back seat, right? And those are things that I say no to. It's like, this past weekend, I got invited to go out fishing and to go out and look at a property. My wife was like, if they don't got a pre-approval letter, you said it before yourself, you ain't going. And I was like, I guess you're right. <laughs> so you went fishing? No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, nope. Nope. I stayed home, handled meetings, little, you know, hung out with the kiddos and the wife. And had I went, I probably would have been in a lot of trouble and sleeping in the doghouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um... – might've been on one of these other calls we had recently about just like quality over quantity and somebody like you that has a full packed schedule and you aren't around your family necessarily, you know, as much as other people maybe that also work at home or whatever. But I'm sure that just that time you do have with them because of that, you really value that at a deeper level and make the most and get a lot more quality out of that time you do have with, with your family, your kids and your wife, which in my, my argument would be that that's still you a lot more out of limited amount of time, but quality over just sitting on the couch, watching TV next to somebody where you're not actually going to a deeper level with them. Yeah. It's just being present. Right. And, um, I know that we're cutting close on time, but, uh, you know, one thing that I want to let everybody know is the biggest thing that hit me this past week is that my buddy, the pastor, he told me, dude, sometimes when you're in this position of confusion, it's almost liberating, you know, and it is a place. The best thing you can do is take off your shoes, right? Metaphoric, metaphorically is take off your shoes, look down at your feet and just realize where you're at. Take inventory of everything that's going around you and be present. Because this is a place as shitty as it, as it is, it may suck. You may be confused. You may be tired. You may be exhausted, but it's a place. Enjoy it while you're there. Be thankful that you have this place to stand on and then get back to it. Right. I like that. I like that. I'll have to implement that a little bit more in my life. I know, um, even if meditation, you know, like they talk about being barefoot when you're when you're sitting down meditating and just like kind of feeling the ground that you're on and just kind of mm-hmm. absorbing kind of where you are in that moment, kind of going off that same idea, but it works. I, I will be the first to tell you that it works. Uh, my grandma was having some issues. I want to tell you this story just cause you brought it up. Uh, my grandma was having some issues out there in Mexico and her doctor prescribed her to take off her shoes early in the morning and go touch grass. <laughs> wow. Okay. And if it, it seemed like it helped her, This lady is like over 70 years old. She works for the government. She works with the police out there in whatever city that she's working in. And she doesn't stop like this. Great. This lady is crazy. I tell everybody that everybody thinks that I've got my entrepreneurial tendencies and business stuff from my dad, but I really got it from my mom's side of the family because my grandmother, she's never home. I call and I'm like, is she there? And they're like, no, she just left. And it's crazy. Hustling. Yeah, dude, it's crazy. That's it's pretty cool. awesome. Yeah. Well, I think we uh, definitely covered quite a bit there, but I think we are definitely overdue to have a, another follow up episode here at some point. My, uh, my co host, Ben, you know, he also has two kids similar age to yours, and we talk some, about a lot of those similar topics with him also. I think it'd be great to have you back on again when he can also join us and just talk through some of more of the parenting side of entrepreneurship and and growth. But um, I guess I'll just yeah. leave the audience with this. I think, you know, whether or not, you know, they're interested in Albuquerque specifically, you know, if they're just interested in just learning more about, you know, just real estate mindset, just, I think you have a lot of great value you provide in your social and just on your personal branding, where it's a, a good way that people can find you if they're wanting just to connect with you. Instagram all day, Instagram okay. all day at Eli Nevadas underscore 
and uh, you'll see me there, cowboy hatted up in my profile picture and all that stuff. And yeah, that that'll be the best way. I love to connect with your audience. Like, this is my bread and butter. I've all, I, you know, I kind of grew up in this world, helping other you know peers around me just kind of get out of ruts and have a different mindset and a different perspective. Just because you know the circumstances and the environments that we were living in weren't the greatest. So just learning how to navigate that and and really kind of create and formulate ways to to do these things in life a lot better, you know, at a simpler way, right? Because there's many crazy ways of doing it. I just want to make it super digestible coming from somebody who's actually living and doing it. So yeah, man, mm -hmm. I'd love to connect with your audience. And you guys, I'll, I'll put his contact info in the show notes after we publish this episode. So you guys can find him there as well. Um, but I think this is just a great episode just for a reminder for anybody that does have a packed schedule, whether it's with family life, or maybe you're just juggling a couple of jobs. Maybe you're in the point of a crossroads in your life and you're trying to pursue something new, kind of like Eli was several years ago when he added real estate on top of everything else he's got going on. And uh, just that inspiration of, you know, it is definitely possible. There's no need to make excuses about not having enough time in the day. It's just a matter of being very intentional and wanting it enough to position yourself in an environment where everybody around you is supporting you and you're able to achieve whatever dreams it is that you're pursuing. Well, that was inspirational for me just to hear a little bit more of your backstory. So thanks for being vulnerable and sharing some of that with us. Of course, man. Well, thank you for having me on. I look forward to the next one. And man, yeah, I'm super excited. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Eli. Yeah, guys, hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, the biggest compliment you can give us is sharing the show with friends, anybody else that you might um, you know, have on your radar that is in a point where they need some extra motivation. Maybe they just are in this uh, position like we're talking about today, where they just need uh, some guidance on how to add more to their plate and succeed more in life. So share the show with a friend. And until next week, we look forward to an all new episode of the Pursuit of Progress podcast. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day.